This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys and seed. Cake Wallet is trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible by contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Philip Hainish of Comet, an open protocol facilitating trustless cross-blockchain applications that will soon be launching an MVP for performing atomic swaps between Bitcoin and Monero. Atomic swaps between Bitcoin and Monero are highly anticipated as a major development in crypto, making Monero even more unstoppable than it already is, with a decentralized method for trustlessly exchanging between Bitcoin and Monero. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Philip, thanks for coming on, man. Or Phil, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for having me, Doug. <laughs> so uh, how's Australia, man? How you doing over there? Good, good. I think we've been quite lucky, especially with the current situation everywhere else. No, it's good down here. Yeah, what what is the Corona situation over there? Is it is it similar to everywhere else? Well, how 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 are you guys handling it over there? Um, it's very. Right now, if you go out on the streets, you wouldn't even realize that there is COVID. That COVID is still a thing. Like last Friday, the bars and restaurants they were packed, huge lines everywhere. And I think we didn't have a case for three, four weeks, something like that. Um, oh, wow. But okay. bef before that, if there's a single case, then they lock up everything and everything gets shut down. Allowed, okay. Yeah, not allowed to leave the state, not allowed to travel. Uh, we were affected by that uh, around Christmas. There were a couple of cases in the northern beaches of Sydney. And then, yeah, Christmas was a bit different, I would say, than usually. Just, yeah. Just staying at home and not doing anything. Yeah, but New besides York. That, yeah, we can't complain. It's really good. Okay. Yeah. Well, you guys are in summertime over there too, right? So. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. New, um, New York is unrecognizable right now. Unfortunately, it's pretty sad. It's pretty sad. It is. Yeah. I I think this spring will start to get back to normal. I'm hoping. I keep but, my fingers uh, crossed for you. What's that? I keep my fingers crossed for you. Yeah, you too, man. I'd love to go to Australia, by the way. Um, what's the scene like over there? What's the what's the crypto scene like in Australia? What's the Bitcoin and uh, in particularly the Monero scene like in Australia? Very small, I would say. Um, sometimes last year, especially Bitcoin and Ethereum is relatively big. And last year, the Bitcoin community started a Socratic seminar series. And that's in my opinion, became a big thing, uh, especially in the crypto space, cryptographer space, compared to other Socratic seminars. That one is very, very technical, and we have a lot of cryptographers there and discuss cryptographic protocols. Um, we used to have quite a few Ethereum meetups. I lost track of these, um, especially because we couldn't meet in person right last year. I know that there are some happening online, but I haven't followed uh, followed up on these and monero i have to be honest that it's i don't know much about the monero community here in sydney really you gotta get you gotta get that going man well M monero community is uh is always pretty secretive right it, it is goes... and it's online right everything's happening online yeah Find these guys on irc and matrix uh, yeah it's kind of funny i feel like monero is struggling with that a little bit balancing it's you know uh private nature versus the need to to market uh we're seeing that a little bit i don't know if you saw um they put out a couple of guys got together in the monero community and they they were trying to reach out to elon musk ah uh, yeah i saw that yesterday or two yeah. days ago yeah exactly <laughs> i think it's an interesting idea you know to get his attention um basically trying to get elon to offer to accept payments in monero for for tesla and then they threw in this whole, we'll give away, I think, three Teslas to uh, charities that the community chooses. But the Monero community, you know, unlike the Bitcoin community or the Doge community, uh, like it became controversial almost. Like, why, why are we trying to market? Why are we reaching out to Elon? 
I'm personally okay with it. I think it's necessary at the end of the day. You know, you could have the best technology in the world. Uh, you know, we could we could build something that's that's perfect digital cash, perfect digital gold. But at the end of the day, you still need to make sure people are aware of it, right? The market needs to know that that information exists, that that, that product exists. What's your take on that? I totally agree. Um, I think Monero is kind of the underdog. It's relatively unknown in the crypto space if I adhere to, to non-coiners. So in my uh, my old friends, they're like, Bitcoin is in the news. They immediately call me like, should I buy, should I buy? But if Monero, they're like, I don't know, I haven't heard about Monero. Why should I care about privacy? So actually, yeah, I think it starts with the need for privacy. And I found a quote some time ago which says some people want privacy, but everyone needs privacy. The, mm. That's the mm. that's the kind of thing, right? You need privacy only if you really need, need it. <laughs> right, and right. So Monero well, is kind of filling the niche in the cryptocurrency space, and it's relatively unknown for now. Yeah. I, I feel like uh, people just don't realize it until it's too late, you know? So I think the market at large is going to start to realize that the 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 intrinsic need for privacy, especially in money. So yeah. are you are you primarily a Bitcoin guy? Are you a, a Monero guy? What's what's your um I try to be agnostic? Yeah, we try to be coin agnostic, but um I'm more I hold more Bitcoin than Monero. And the first thing I had was Bitcoin. So I I fell into this rabbit hole with Bitcoin just quite a while ago. Okay. Yeah, I started as a Bitcoin guy and then made my way into Monero. Uh, I, I won't exhaust the reasons why I say the same thing all, all the time on this podcast. But so you you guys, decide, you're, you're building atomic swaps or a, a, a version of it, a way to basically uh, seamlessly transfer between Monero and Bitcoin in a, in a trustless manner. And so why did you guys choose Monero? Why, why are you working on this project? Why do you think it's important? Why not atomic swaps between Bitcoin and, you know, Litecoin, which I'm sure would be much easier, or, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum, if that doesn't exist already? I love this question. Uh, let me take one step back. So the Coblox, we are, our company is called Coblox, um, develops the Comet protocol to achieve our vision, which is, to have an open financial system which is truly inclusive and censorship resistant. And we thought that by connecting all the blockchains with each other, we can achieve this exactly this future. Because all the blockchains, they work in an isolated manner and we have different financial ecosystems evolving on different blockchains like uh, Ethereum, the, the DeFi world, uh, or we can take Tron as well and Bitcoin completely decoupled and then Monero completely separated as well. So we started in 2018 by connecting Monero, uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin using HTLCs, uh, like hash time lock contracts. But this technology has a huge downside, and that is that you use the same hash on each chain, and then some third party monitoring both chains can link those two transactions with each other and then follow up where the money flows. So if you want to change Bitcoin to Ethereum, you lock up some Bitcoin and someone knows, all right, this was your Bitcoin wallet. Now we link the transaction on Ethereum and you take your Ether out to your new address. And now we know where your Ether is. And that's terrible for privacy and especially censorship resistance and non-discriminating way because now we can make, yeah, exclude certain people. So sometimes last year we then said, all right, let's make privacy the most important thing of our protocol and we started connecting grin and bitcoin and for that we had to learn more cryptography like because grin had uh, doesn't have script support so we had to use some adapter signature magic and connect it with bitcoin that worked out pretty well and then joel cooker presented at uh 36 3 c3 <laughs> um his protocol and we were like cool so you can connect monero as well um we knew about the cryptographic primitives but we didn't figure out the game theoretic uh, game theory of the protocol 
And yeah, then that's when we started last year, I think around November, to connect Monero and Bitcoin, which was always our main goal. Monero and Bitcoin at privacy preserving atomic swaps. That's like huge. That's really yeah, cool. I, yes, super, super excited that you guys are working on this. I mean, I, I kind of see it as, you know, one of the, the major pillars of, of what crypto will be. I mean, you guys are creating um, a major part of what the future infrastructure will be, I, I hope. Uh, and I think a lot of people, a lot of true Bitcoiners and Monero enthusiasts, I think, see it that way, hopefully. What's the difference between Commit and some of these other ones that we're seeing now? And this is great that we're seeing, I don't know if you want to call it competition, but we're seeing a lot of different people now trying to work on Bitcoin to Monero, Monero to Bitcoin, atomic swaps. What's the difference between what you guys are doing and somebody like Farcaster? Is it essentially the same thing, just different methodology? What's going on there? Um, it's basically, we try to solve the same problem, but have a different approach. Um, I really like how the Farcast project tries to solve the problem because that's exactly the same way how we started in 2018. We thought that the Comet protocol should be comparable to the IP, the TCP IP protocol. So it needs to be open source, needs to be freely and publicly available for everyone. So we started with designing RFCs, um, specification for network communication, tried to standardize the, the contracts, the smart contracts on chain and so on. And we, we heavily focused on the developer. Our goal was to build developer tools so that other developers take our protocols and our libraries and then integrate it into their products. Maybe like an, an exchange who wants to become a, a trustless exchange um, or a wallet to like allow like uh, the Monero, um, Monero to approach where you seamlessly can send Monero to a Bitcoin address. But unfortunately, we realized that none of those developers came. Um, it, maybe the space was too young or it was still too complex. So we thought we need to take a different approach. And that's where we are right now. We think that we need to build MVPs uh, to showcase what our protocols can do, um, get users out there using it, optimize the protocol to have a good UX. And then we think that this will attract developers who then can take our libraries and they will have different requirements of how they would like to use it. Um, yeah, that, so basically that's where we are. We build an MVP, to put it out there, and then hope that developers will jump on this train and think, cool, hey, um, they guys, they, they build a cool open source protocol. They have users out there, they are traders, they have uh, tools to support market makers and so on. We want to build that into our product. And then that's the time when we need to turn around and say, all right, for um, supporting different use cases, we need to have a clear specification of the protocol. We need to standardize network communication between different implementations and so on. So that's the difference between our approach and for example, the Farcast approach. They take the bottom up approach where they start with the specification right now and then implement it. While we just implement it for the most primitive version and then once this is established and proven, we can then go down and define the protocol. I actually love that you're taking that approach. I mean, I feel like that might get us to the, you know, the finish line faster, right? That's traditionally how things normally evolve. Um, there's a need, you're building an MVP to fulfill that need. So what, actually, let me step back for a second before I, I was gonna ask, what is the MVP? What's it gonna look like? Um, but stepping back, what is kind of the business model here? What is keeping you guys going other than, you know, uh, this dream of, you know, a cypherpunk dream of connecting Bitcoin and Monero? Or is it just that? Or is there is there how are you guys running? Are you guys just running on hopes and dreams here? Or is there a, is there a business model? <laughs> Number go up. It's not a business model. <laughs> no, it no. Is. is. Tell me, is that what, what what's keeping you guys going? Um, what's the incentive? Well, the incentive is that the dreams of building the open financial system, that's for sure. But obviously that dream won't feed you, right? It won't pay your salary. 
So similar to the TCP IP protocol, we think that the monetization needs to happen on top of what we build. Um, our expertise is in, is in building decentralized applications and protocols, and the money can then be made with a product on top of it. So let's take the atomic swap protocol between Monero and Bitcoin. Um, we could just build trader software like a taker and a maker tool and put it out there and then run our own maker. And that could get us some profit back into, yeah, into our own business. So you guys will be in the best position to, to be the first ones to do that as opposed, and it's going to be open source. Anybody will be able to come in and, and do that, but you guys, yes, yeah. the ones that are creating the actual protocol yeah. will be in the best position to do that. That's great. We have a, a small advantage over others because we have the expertise of building it. We built it, but everyone should be able to just run it. And it, I think there's, it's similar how the stock market started initially, the electronic one. Um, where the, the experts, they built the infrastructure and then they just split up all over the world, became experts and started all of those different companies. And they had this little edge, always this little edge. And that's how they kept profitable. We think we can run a similar approach, but it's a bit further away. Amazing. Um, so what is the MVP? What will the minimal viable product look like the, for this first version of, of commit? Comment. The, the use case follows more a um, OTC trading style. So right now we have a single maker, single market maker, and you can you can compare it to like um, a shapeshift approach. You have a nice website, you see a single rate, and you can then take it or leave it. Right now we don't support traders to um, we don't allow traders to create their own orders. That's always the market maker. So it's like you have one maker, we call them service provider, for example, just service provider. And he offers to their customers trading Monero to Bitcoin. And that is the, the, the smallest use case we can achieve. But eventually we want to get into the pure peer-to-peer -peer trading where you don't have to connect to one single market maker. Um, because that's still not fully censorship resistant, right? that market maker can still decide on who can connect to them or not. So yeah, it's an OTC style trading solution for Bitcoin and Monero. And are you teaming up? Who's that market maker going to be? Are you guys teaming up with somebody who's already in the market? Or are you guys going to, you're, you guys are going to be that. Um, we as Coblox won't probably will not will not run it as a market maker, um, but every one of us individual might or might not. There are certain legal restrictions attached to running such a service, I would say. So as a business itself, it might be it's not our business model to run it ourselves. Mm. Um, but yeah, we put the software out there and our current status is that we can swap on public stage nets. State, um, on the Monero stage net and the Bitcoin test net. So everyone can just try it out. And once we are happy and it's stable enough, we can just put it on mainnet and then anyone can run it. So I'm a, I'm a hardcore Monero guy in that, you know, I love Monero. I understand, you know, the, the overall architecture of it, but I'm not a very technical guy. So, you know, I, I'm pretty, I, I use Cake Wallet. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't run, even run a full node. I know those in the Monero community are probably, you know, uh, shocked by that, but I, I just don't. And uh, I think there's a lot of people like me that aren't really super technical. When does this get to the point where a guy like me is using this in my everyday life to swap between Bitcoin and Monero? Are, is that, uh, you know, months away, years away? Um, what is that going to look like? It's going to be like potentially integrated into something like cake wallet or local bitcoins what what is it going to look like and when can we expect to see it i don't want to make any false promises <laughs> false hope there uh, just but general I idea we, we, we want to hold probably, it to it it's it's months i would say not weeks so it's gonna be a while um right now we focus on crypto native crypto experts and we require people to use the uh, Monero RPC wallet, like the default wallet, which comes with your node, but you don't have to run a full node yourself. The thing is that um, from 
due to technical limitations, we use some features which is only available by this wallet. And in order to be more open with other wallets, like Cake Wallet, uh, we would need to change something in our protocol. I didn't want to go too deep into the technical, so <laughs> just leave it as high level as that. Okay. You could get into it a little bit more. You want to get into it a little bit more? I'm sure we, we have some pretty uh, high level listeners here. I may not grasp it all, but uh, maybe give it a sure. go a little bit. Sure, sure. So the, the atomic swap is um, when it's finalized, the party on the Monero side learns an additional private key. And this is a, a multi sig uh, private key. So one party, he had one part of the key first, and then he learned another key from the other party through the phase of the atomic swap. And these need to be combined, and then you need to create a new wallet. And that is the tricky part. So right now, um, the uh, Monero RPC wallet has this functionality to create a new wallet from secret key. And that's basically all you need. We could easily get around this with an additional transaction. So let's, but let's take one step back because that might just all be gibberish. You need to understand the whole atomic swap protocol so that it makes sense. <clears throat> so you have, uh, two parties, right? One on Monero, one on Bitcoin. And the Bitcoin side needs to lock up funds first. Then the Monero side locks up funds. And the Monero side holds the secret to redeem um, the Bitcoin side. And one, if he does that, he reveals another secret so that the party on the Bitcoin side can take the Monero. Now, the cool idea of this protocol is that you do not have to spend the Monero immediately because you are the only one who holds both keys now. And we just import this private key into your wallet and then you can spend it whenever you want to do it. A simple solution would be to just add another transaction and create this, uh, spend this money into your personal account like a cake wallet or so. But that would involve another transaction and transaction fees, which we would we try to avoid. So in order to integrate it into a cake wallet in the most efficient way, we would need to have deep access to the cake wallet features to be able to import an additional private key so that it shows up in your wallet. Mm, okay. Very interesting. So so maybe the first vert might even be its own new wallet. Somebody who's really Right, looking to to get it off the ground might start a wallet from scratch that's built with that integrated at its, in its base. That's interesting. So, how about just just sticking with atomic swaps for a second on how it works? Um, what essentially compels people to go through with the transaction, or actually, I guess, what happens if one side bails out? Uh, how how does that work? So, what what keeps the uh, What's the mm -hmm. game theory there? How do we make sure the transaction all goes through and everybody plays appropriately? Yeah, that's that's exactly the game theoretic part which uh, Joe Gooker found out. Uh, kudos to him. So the by definition, atomic swaps have to be atomic in a way that either both transactions go through and both parties receive the other one's funds, or you have a rollback and you get your money, get your money back. So I said um, the Bitcoin party locks up month funds first. And now if Monero party never moves forward, then he can always recover with a refund transaction after a certain time period. <clears throat> and then if the Monero one also locked up funds, <clears throat> but the Bitcoin side says, hey, I actually do not want to move forward. Actually, it is not 100% correct, sorry. Um, the Monero side doesn't redeem, then the Bitcoin side still has time to refund. And once it refunds, he also reveals the secret so that the Monero side learns his, the re refund secret and can take back his money as well. Mm. So there's a, a couple, couple between coupling between the redeem, where a secret is redeemed for taking the other party's money, and the same for the refund where you roll back and you get your money back and these are linked together so as soon as long as both parties are online at all times they will always get their money back beautiful 
How do you see this practically affecting the market and the relationship between Bitcoin and Monero? Um, I hope that we see all of those trading volume from centralized exchanges to move to complete decentralized exchanges. Um, this might be a little bit further down the way, but I personally was affected by an exchange hack in in 2014, relatively unknown exchange back then. <laughs> and I don't want anyone else to experience the same thing. It's It's just like you sit there and you can't withdraw your money and you're like, why everyone warned me everyone told me to put it in your cold storage and you had some amount there to trade and then yeah money is just gone so we want to protect the users to not run into this problem and allow them to just trade outside of centralized exchanges completely trustless and i think that would make a, a huge boost in trading because some people just cannot trade monero right it's not available on all exchanges if you take uh, Japan, for example, they don't have any privacy coins. Australia, they don't have any privacy coins on, on centralized exchanges. So if they would want to buy Monero, if I want to buy Monero today, I have to do, go to local Monero. And that's always based on trust. So I think with this protocol, we can increase the trading volume between Bitcoin and Monero and allow anyone to trade with a high security and privacy. How would the fees work? I don't, I don't think we spoke about that, actually. How would the, the fees work as opposed to a typical centralized exchange? or um, A bit different because by the nature of this protocol, you have multiple transactions and you need to pay transaction fees for these. So there's this involved and the maker itself, himself might also charge a certain fee for his rate. That's his business model, right? Do you think it would be a premium to what you see on centralized exchanges or it'd be less? How do you think that would work economically? That's a real good question. Um, we will need to see how it works out. Um, I would assume that it would be slightly more expensive than on centralized exchanges because one business model for those makers is to just arbitrage with centralized exchanges and just add a small spread on top of it. And from what we understood from normal users, they are fine with a certain extra, pay an extra set, uh, pay a certain extra because they get trustless trades for that and they get the privacy for that. Um, ideally, we are better than and lower than centralized exchanges, but then it might not be profitable for a maker anymore. Hmm. And then, you know, you have Monero purists talking about the fact that you know, they're not going to, you know, this is great. Sounds great in theory, uh, excited about it. But they're not going to want to trade their clean Monero for dirty Bitcoin. And, you know, this seems like the perfect arena where that's going to take place, where somebody would come here as opposed to a centralized exchange. They would use something like an atomic swap to, uh, you know, get rid of those dirty Bitcoins without any KYC AML. What's... What's your, what's your thinking there? How do you think that's going to play out? It's a, that's an interesting topic. Um, there are quite some, let's call them tainted Bitcoins out there, and you might not want to hold any of these. Um, you could, that's, that's a business model of chain analysis and so on, right? Uh, there are also open source solutions out there which flag just the set, the UTXO set, <clears throat> and you could integrate that into the swapping protocol so that um, you just automatically reject any money coming from those addresses. Personally, I wouldn't be too worried about this because I don't do day trading anymore. I just buy to invest and just hold. And I think that by the time I'm willing to sell, the problem of tainted Bitcoin has been resolved. So there are different solutions like Samurai, Wasabi, um, or a protocol we developed, uh, the A2L protocol, which allows you to mix UTXO steps on Bitcoin. And that's how you could get rid of tainted Bitcoin. But yeah, for the normal user, this might actually be a problem. And you don't want to be in the situation where you 
did a Monero to Bitcoin swap, you received some Bitcoin and now you send it to an exchange to cash out and they like, hey, 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 where did you get that one from? <laughs> so it's, it is a problem, yeah. Yeah, maybe it will open people's eyes a little bit to, you know, what what makes Monero valuable at its core, you know, the fact that it that it can't be tainted. What is your opinion there? I, I mean, we talk about the, this topic at nauseum on this show, but what's your take on on the current state of affairs in Bitcoin versus Monero in terms of the fact that Bitcoin can effectively be tainted, Monero seemingly can't? Uh, I heard you say you think ev eventually that won't be an issue, but I guess what's your, your current take on that? Yeah, right now Monero definitely has the advantage over it with the ring signatures approach. This is just, yeah, technically advanced over Bitcoin. Bitcoin is catching up slowly, but uh, it's not yet there. Taproot is one step further to make um, transaction a little bit more private. It's not completely private as in Monero. You still have addresses, you still see the amounts. Um, but I think in the future they should be on par and then it's a matter of preference which which you want to use it will i think bitcoin will never be as private as monero that's just by all right that's, that's what i was looking for that's what i was looking <laughs> for we'll, we'll, we'll make that the quote when we uh, when we post this show <laughs> actually probably will um thank you so much for coming on man where can people or what can the monero community do obviously they want to follow the project but is there anything that the community can do to help push this along is there any is there anything that can be done to help help make this happen definitely so we as i said we're working on the mvp right now which is just about to be finished so on that side we're looking for users to try it out to test it give provide feedback see to verify that the use case is worth to pursuing further and if there are developers out there for cake wallet or other wallets <clears throat> who are keen on looking integrating uh, such a swap solution um they should also reach out to us. Now that Monero Toad, this TO disappeared, um, there is a gap to be filled and maybe this trading, this atomic swap protocol can fill such a gap. And then we need to focus on what's really important for us uh, on the protocol and developer tools and the specification. And yeah. How, do, how should they reach out to you guys? Um, we are on Reddit. Re regularly on rated and post our updates there but we also have our public chat on matrix which is just comet i think let me just look it up matrix comet yeah it's just comet we have a few different comet based chat there is comet monero and comet is the general one to just land in there and then we we forward them to the different projects we are running have any of the wilds reached out to you at all about this yet? I would, I would think they would. Um, we have someone. I'm not sure if I can mention it right now. Okay, no worries. But well, yeah. that, that's good. That's good that that's happening. All right. Is there any way for people to follow you and learn more? You know, follow you in the space. Are you on on Twitter and anywhere else? Yeah, uh, we have the Comet Network handle on Twitter. Um, personally, I'm also on Twitter called Bonomat. Uh, we also have a mailing list, the Comet Dev mailing list, which is more developer focused. I can share you the links later on if you want to put them in the description of the interview. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely send us those links. All right, Phil, thank you so much, man. This is this is very exciting. Monero community is, is going to eat this up. This is you know what we've all been waiting for. So um, I'm super happy about this. Thanks again, man. Thanks for your hard work. Thanks for having me. All right. Cheers. See you. Enjoy Bye. your day. All right, so so we had ended the conversation. I ended recording, and then Phil and I were talking a little bit more, and he was telling me a little bit more information about what we could expect. And actually, I thought it was important to to capture this. So, Phil, you want to you want to explain? Yeah, sure. So right now, the atomic swap protocol between Monero and Bitcoin requires the party on Bitcoin to move first, but that means that this party is subject to the draining attack. <clears throat> which means if someone wants to swap with, well, let's say the two of us do an atomic swap and you'd like, you would lock up funds on Bitcoin first, then I can always bail out and you know you can get your money back, but you pay transaction fees for that. And that's the draining attack. 
So mm. like enough people come to you, you just keep burning money and you don't get anything. And the issue is that um, the protocol is designed in a way that if the Monero money is locked up and Bitcoin never moves, then you never learn a secret and you never get the money back on Monero. So in order to overcome that, we develop a protocol which is drawn up there right now, um, which allows you to lock up the funds on Monero first. But for that, we have to implement adapter signatures onto Monero's ring signatures, which is a little bit more complex, mathematically said. And we need to have more access, deeper access to the wallet. And yeah, this is currently in the phase of being development, developed. And we are working together with an academic partner in Austria, uh, University of Vienna, TU Vienna, sorry, to be correct. And yeah, that's that's going to be a game changer because then you can have a, a market maker who offers both directions. And this is basically needed to run an exchange, whether it's a centralized or decentralized exchange. Mm -hmm. So when the MVP launches, it's is it going to have this additional component or you guys are going to launch with just the ability to to lock up the, the Bitcoin? Yeah, no, not yet. So right now we start with only one direction <clears throat> and start from scratch in parallel with the new protocol. And then once this is stable enough, because we need to do some more cryptography on this protocol, then we merge it together and then you have both directions in one tool. All right. I'm glad we jumped back on. I think the community is going to enjoy hearing that. Thanks again. Uh, yeah, we'll, there we'll is leave it at that. One, last, one last thing on that. Actually, we wrote a paper about it and I did not publish it on the uh, Monero ISC, I think. I only forwarded it to the Farcaster project. But there's okay. a paper about this. Yeah, if you provide us that link, we'll put that into the show notes as well. And uh, like we, like I was saying, I would love to have you come back on. So if you guys make any further breakthroughs or progress in that, I'd love to have you guys come back on and talk about it. Definitely, yeah. Looking forward to it. All right, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.